So you're stuck with me today. Is that okay? Uh, when, I was, when I was a young man, I didn't tell my wife I was going to say this, so I'll probably get in trouble for this, but uh, this, this past week, um, I told my wife, I said, you know, I've seen a couple people doze off during church, so I'm going to call you out. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm just kidding. My pastor, when I was an old school Pentecostal pastor, uh, he was a little short guy, and he would get, his face would turn blood red, and he would, he'd be like stomping his hand and his foot during service, and if someone fell asleep, he would call them out. I got called out a few times, so uh, just be ready. Who's who's ready to stay awake? Amen? Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn or you can follow the PowerPoint. I'm not going to read it quite yet. I have a few things I want to talk about. I want to set the stage for our title about being connected. It's called Stay Connected, but I want to get into the, the God, God's Word today and just speak and let Him uh, you know, minister into our hearts. Uh, most of the time, and I say this, and I know Pastor Jeff does as well, when we give a sermon, a lot of times... For me, it's God speaking to me. God will use my own sermon to speak into my heart and to change me, and I just get to share it with others, and I hope that that's okay, because I believe God ministers to all of us, amen, through that, and I, I'm just, it's an honor and a privilege to be in God's house. If you're a, a first-time guest, as Crystal had mentioned earlier, we'd like to welcome you for worshiping with us for the first time here at Harrisonburg First Assembly of God. Uh, you know, it's just a privilege and an honor to be in the house of the Lord to be able to stand in, in, with folks that are just like myself who are honoring the one and only God, amen, that we can, we can put him before anything else and we can come out and celebrate what God is doing in our lives, even in the midst of turmoil and trials. And we're going to get talk about that a little later at the end of our service. Uh, we're going to have some people potentially stand in proxy. We have a lot of people who are going through some tough situations, and we want to stand in agreement with them that God is going to do a miraculous work in their lives, that they can give a testimony just as, as much as Leah and Bill had given to us about their grandson, about the healing that took place in his life. And it's been confirmed. Let me, let me just go on record and tell you, that my wife, as many of you or some of you may know, works in an MRI department, and she sees things, tumors that are real on, on scans. Now, she can't give me details on who they were. That's against the law. But she said to me, Trevor, when that tumor shows up, it's not something that just disappears. It's pretty obvious when it's a tumor and it's the real deal on an MRI. She said because of the different pictures. Now, she could give you a much better idea and understanding. She's been doing it for 20 couple years. But she said there's no way you can fake that. There's, it's real. God obviously did a miraculous work in that young man's life. It wasn't something that someone just made up. It was real. It was authentic, and it was God. Can we say amen? And we're going to stand on that. It's confirmed. So devil, you're a liar. Amen? It was the real deal. God did do a work in that child's life. So today I want to talk to you about, you know, stay connected. Now, how many of you would agree or would say that our world is more connected in history than it's ever been before. Everyone pretty much will raise their hand. How many of us would say not only are we connected, but we are connected worldwide? We are connected worldwide. The internet, television, mobile phones, apps on your phone, tablets, iPads, we probably know more about things, news, history, weather, and even each other, probably more than we really need to know. Between CNN and Fox News, how can we miss anything? Amen? We get more perspectives, agendas, ideas, thoughts about how to of doing just about anything or everything. If you don't know how to make it, I guarantee you if you go to YouTube, I'm sure you'll find a video on how to do it. How many do that? Amen. I go in there all the time. I'm like, yeah, this guy knows what he's doing. Even if he doesn't, I think he does. <laughs> right? <laughs> How about Pinterest? It will give you the best ideas that you will ever need to know. And Crystal Harper said, there you go. The reason I say that is I always pick, I always, I always ask this question, where did we forget about our own creative mind? I always say that. I, Pinterest kind of blows my mind, but it is pretty cool. If you were at Dayton Days yesterday, you would have seen that creative mind at work. Amen? If you want to be connected, you can use your smartphone to talk to someone and see them at the same time, no matter where they are on this planet. And, and now, in modern technology, you can be on your plane now, on an airplane and talk. Did you know that? The last time I flew, they said, you can now turn your, you can turn your phone on, and you're now connected to the Internet through their, their, I think they charge a little bit. They charge for everything now. 
But you can, at the same time, you can be, feel like when you're talking to that person, no matter where they are throughout the world, you feel like you're actually standing there with them because you're so connected. Like, you know, when you get on Skype or if you get on FaceTime, you can, you can talk to people. And a lot of parents do that with their kids when they're gone or, or maybe a loved one's traveling. Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I can probably find out what a lot of you did yesterday by basically going to your blog, your page, or by opening an app by simple, or simply by texting you. How many of you know that you, there's, an, there's a, uh, a, an app called Instagram or excuse me, Snapchat, am I right? Kids help me out here, Snapchat. And if you're on Snapchat and you don't turn off one certain button on there, I can see where you are at all times. Did you know that? It's true, the teenagers, am I right? Some of them, that's how I know where they are. I send them messages, hey, what are you doing? I told Emily a few months ago, I said, Emily, why are you, in West, why are you over there in West Virginia? She said, we're visiting. I knew exactly where she was because of that. We were connected. We are connected in every way imaginable, aren't we? As people, we're connected. Jesus also, <clears throat> excuse me, gives us an illustration of this connection in John 15 when he talks about the true vine. Now, when I was reading this scripture, I just kept rehearsing it, reading over it, reading over it, and I thought, wow, God, your truths are so obvious. And when we begin to get, dig into his word, we start to see the truths in that. And I want to touch on that today. So if, is it on the PowerPoint behind me? Someone just say, yes, it is. Okay, awesome. Good job, Melinda. Good job, PowerPoint team. Thank you for all you do to make myself and Pastor Jeff look good. Can we say amen? amen. It says here, starting in verse one, it says, I am the true vine and my father is the wine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they, can, they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you may bear more, much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much again for an opportunity to be in your house. God, uh, without you, Lord, uh, there's no purpose, Father, but with you, all things, God, have purpose, Lord, and meaning. And Father, we just pray this morning, God, that this message goes forth. Lord, it penetrates into our hearts, Lord. It penetrates our thoughts. Lord, God, minister to uh, the ones that need, need this message, Lord, today, the ones that are at home. Lord the, Lord, the ones that may be sick in body, Lord, the ones that may be struggling, Father. We just ask you, Lord, to continue to be with our pastor, Lord, as we honor him today. And, and Lord, we just ask you to be with him and keep him safe as he travels, he and his wife, Bonnie, Lord, and continue to minister even to them and give them as this is a time of refreshing. And for that, Lord, we give you praise and we give you honor. In your name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Of course, this, uh, this uh, scripture here, Jesus is speaking to his disciples he knows what's coming. He knows what's on the horizon. He has spent year, several years teaching them his truths. He is giving them this illustration of the vine and the branches. The vine was a fixture in their times as a prominent plant uh, due to the wine as being a drink among that culture. The illustration was used to encourage them to continue to stay connected to the vine. Speaking as of he, Jesus, as the true vine, and of course the wine dresser being God himself, who would continue to fashion the vine. He was using things familiar to them, as Jesus did a lot. He was painting a picture, using it to give them a more solid understanding. And how many of you know that sometimes we need a better understanding? Because we're human and sometimes we don't get it. When we as Christians look at this parable, or maybe the way that the disciples would have heard it, how do you consider your connection status to Christ. How would you consider yours? 
Today, as we look into this scripture, let's unveil or unpack its application to our lives. Let's not just hear it. Let's see how it applies to us. The answer to that question should be, Jesus said, abide in me. That's what he said in the scripture. He said, abide in me. And of course, abide is to remain, to continue, or to stay. In verse 5, here's what he says. He said, I am the vine. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. In verse 1, he said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. In verse 2, it goes on to say, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. He says here, he takes the branch away or he prunes it. Now, how many of you think that sounds like a happy thing, right? If you think about it, I mean, to be pruned and clipped and cut away, that, that sounds pretty harsh, right? Takes away. Notice it reads that. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. Now, some Bible scholars translate this to mean that the vine dresser lifts the branch up as was a practice in those ancient times. Um, uh, for a vine that may be dragging or lying on the ground to get more sun for better growth. That means that the vine was probably wilting and laying on the ground, so they lifted it up. The verb translated in the Greek, cut off, ario, means to literally lift up or it translates to take away. And my second part of that is it can, it can represent that God wants to clean up the vine, amen? He wants to clean up the vine with the cutting off of the vine or putting it to fire because it's of no use. Better to bleed than to wither, the bleeding will stop, but when something withers, it limits the growth to the entire plant. How many of you would agree with that? The word here, prune, in the Greek, the original word is katharyo, which also means to cleanse or to purify. Now, I've got a friend who, every once in a while, my wife and I help this gentleman out. He, he grows flowers. He grows lots of flowers, and it's amazing. He's a Mennonite uh, plant farmer. Uh, he, he grows flowers, and I just... I mean, it's amazing what he can do with flowers. And he said to me one day, he said, do you know how to make your mom the most beautiful mom ever and you'll love it from year in and year out? Some of you green thumbs in here and mom growers, you know what I'm get, about to say. He said about 4th of July, you prune it and you clean it and you cut off all the stuff that's not really growing. You cut it back. And I'm like, really? You mean even when it's starting to have a little bit of a bud on it, you do that? He said, absolutely. He said, because in the fall, when it comes to full bloom, it will be absolutely the most gorgeous flower. And how many of you know I failed at that this year? And I've got some, uh, I've got some uh, of course, the weather didn't help either, but some of my mums are, are kind of falling over and they don't look as pretty. And I thought, you know what? My wife even said to me on the week of 4th of July, you probably should trim those back. And I didn't listen, amen? Uh, sometimes we guys don't listen. Sometimes they know more than we do. How does Jesus say he used, to do, he used to do this in our lives? How is he going to get us to understand? What is he illustrating here? He said, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. He said to the disciples, because of the word I have spoken to you. What word is he speaking of? He's speaking of what? God's word. He said, abide in me, meaning we abide in his word. We stay in his word. We connect with his word because the word does what? It, the Word condemns sin. It inspires holiness. It promotes growth. It motivates our faith and reveals God's power for victory. How many need power in your life today? We need a victory. Amen? Some of you don't need a victory. Come on now. I know you need a victory. Come on. In the Word, we find that it reaches into places that, that we cannot even go. In Hebrews 4.12, and I have a lot of Scripture for you today, it says, for the Word of God is living and is what? It's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It goes to where you cannot. Can we say amen? The Word of God is, is sharper. And in the Word, we also experience growth. In 1 Peter 2, 2, it says, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may do what? You may grow thereby. You will grow. You will experience spiritual growth. The word also changes us, not man's philosophies. You know, as Paul wrote to the church and to the Thessalonians, here's what he says. He said, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, 
ceasing, excuse me, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the words of men, but as it is the truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. He said, you received the word because you believed what we said to you. It was the word that started to penetrate and it changed them. Amen. They were abiding, uh, they were staying in, abiding in the word. Jesus said the word is truth. We've read this many, many times in John 8, 31 and 32. He says, then Jesus said to the Jews who believed, notice there, the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? Shall make you free. How many want to be free today? How many of us want to abide in the word and be set free today? Come on. There are many people walking around in our society that need to hear the word and it needs to set them free because it will, amen? That's a promise. The word of God is our standard. Pastor Jeff preached that very sermon last Sunday. He proposed that to us. When we remain in the word, we become God's best version of ourselves. How many want to be God's best version? I don't know about you, but I want to be God's best version of me. Because without God, I'm what? What's the scripture say? I am nothing. But in, if I abide in him, I will be the best I can be. We begin to take on the form of its truths, its actions, and we resemble the attributes of Christ. How many want to be an attribute, have the attributes of Christ? Amen. When we stand before our heavenly father, how many of us want God to say, man, you're taking on, you took on the form of Christ. Not that we are Christ, don't, don't read that wrong, but you, you read my word and you applied it to your heart. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. How many want to be new today? Amen? We want to be changed. Jesus praying for his disciples. Here's what he says. He's praying to God. He said in John 17.17, 17, he said, sanctify them. By your truth, because your word is truth. Sanctify them by your truth, because your word is truth. I want to be true today, amen? Here's my question. Do we allow the word to prune and to cut off the things that go against what it reveals to us about in its truths? Do we allow that? Do we hear it? Do we allow it to influence our decisions? Or do we just continue to live according to our own beliefs or our own understanding, or our own philosophies. Is that how we do it? Can we honestly say the Word is becoming alive in us? I want the Word of God to come alive in me. Amen? I want it to start to do things in me that I never thought possible, and that's what happens today. Or would we say, I don't read it much, or I don't study it much? Because I guarantee you, if you don't, that life and that, that, that wilt will begin to happen in your life. We will be like the, 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 you know, the, the, the limb off or the branch that begins to wilt, and we begin to do what? What happens to a, a wilting branch? Eventually, what happens? It eventually dies. I don't know about you, but I don't want to die. Spiritually, I want to be alive. To flourish, to flourish on the vine, we must adhere to God's word and exercise its truths. Amen? How many know what it's like to exercise? It's to do what? It's to get into motion, to apply, to do something about it, not just talk about it. James 1.22, everybody's heard this scripture. I used it many times, many, many times. I remember many years ago, this was our, our theme scripture for one of our kids' camps. It says, but, but, be, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then what's the last part? It said deceiving yourselves. We're deceiving ourselves if we think that just hearing the word, but we need to apply it to our hearts, amen? We need to begin to let it invest into us and, and to take hold into our thoughts and into our hearts because I believe that when you start to do that, things will start to change, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Jesus said also there in John 15, he said, if you, in verse seven, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and that shall be done for you. Now, that scripture is a little bit misused from time to time. How many would say amen? Sometimes we ask for the new this or new that. Or I was talking to our students, and I'm going to go off, off topic just a second or, or off uh, my notes a minute. One of the things that I was with a young pastor who graduated from Bible college, and we were talking, and we were, he said, you know, we sure do, and I may have mentioned this before. He said, we sure do pray selfishly a lot of times, don't we? 
He said, we go to God and we ask God for everything. We have a laundry list of things. We're like, God, I need this, 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 and I need this. And we never once say, God, what do you need from me? Isn't it true? We have that laundry list. We, we, we go to him with those type things. How do we ask God? This is a promise from Jesus, of course, when he said, my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, let me move on and, and explain what I'm talking about. How do we ask God what we desire? How do we do that? In those personal times, right? In those personal times of prayer, where at? Where, do we, where are we when we're in that personal time with prayer with God? We are in his presence. Now, Bill, Bill Fawcett is, is an gr- awesome teacher, as many of you know. He teaches on Sunday mornings, and he also teaches on Wednesday evenings. He and Beth share in, in teaching. And this, a couple weeks ago, Bill was teaching a class, and he said, Trevor, that's a good sermon title, so I wrote it down. I was listening, Bill. I actually wrote it down. He said, in your presence, in his presence. And he was fired up. He, was, he said, we need to be in his presence. And a few days ago, uh, Beth Huddleston, many of you know Brad, came home this past week. He was, in, he was in Australia for three or four weeks. And Beth, is she here today? Beth and I were, were driving down the road. She needed a ride home because she had to bring her car up to Harrisonburg to get it worked on. And she said, we were just talking about church in general and things. She said, Trevor, what we need most is to be in the presence of the Lord. We need to abide. We need to be in his presence. Amen. We need to stand in the presence of God. We need to be with him. We need to. And why? Here is where our lives of being connected can sometimes get in the way. How many of you agree sometimes that gets in the way? As we stay plugged into so many things and connected worldwide to so many things, we tend to neglect our time in his presence. We begin to start to... fall away. We begin to wilt when we are not in his presence. We need to unplug from FaceTime, and we need to get connected to FaceTime. Amen? How many have faith, face, FaceTime, right? And we use it. Some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. All the teenagers know exactly what I'm talking about. We need to unplug. In Exodus 3, I can't even imagine when I read this, what, what God was saying to Moses. I don't even know what Moses would have been thinking. When he was standing before that burning bush, can you imagine being standing in the presence of the Lord? Can you imagine what it was like standing there on Mount Horeb when Moses saw that? And God spoke to him and said, Moses, don't come any closer. You're on holy ground. And I'll get back to that in a moment. He also, when Moses in Exodus 34 was standing on Mount Sinai, when God had instructed him to bring the the two stone tablets. This was the second time because we know what happened the first time. He he was angry and he threw the first set down and broke them. So God had to have him do it again. How many would like doing things twice? It was perfection both times, amen? But God said, come, let's do it again. And here's what it reads. I'll read it to you in verse five through seven. He said, now the Lord descended in in the cloud and stood with him there. Oh, I don't know about you, but I'd start getting happy there. And proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And here's what it says. Moses fell on his face. And here's what he said. If now, God, if now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. Moses was in holy ground. Moses was standing before God himself, and what does he do? He falls on his face, and he says, Lord, have, let me find grace in your sight. Let me pray He said, I pray, go among us and go. We are a stiff-necked people. We have sinned. Pardon our iniquity. Take us as an inheritance because, church, even in the United States of America, I feel like that's where we are in in so many ways. We have have turned our backs and God wants to, uh, he wants to be among us today. He wants us to, to fall before him and just praise and honor him. Amen. Paul says 
In Philippians 4, 6, he says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by what? Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We pray we humble, with humble petition. That's what the NIV says. Uh, with petition, we give thanks. And here's what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Here's what he says. In this scripture, uh, sometimes I, I, I'll be honest with you. I've, I've been in situations where I feel like this takes place. And, and I know it's kind of a tough scripture to read, but it's true. See, if it wasn't true, God would, wouldn't have allowed it to have been in Scripture, amen? But Jesus is speaking here. He says, and when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. They have it. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to the Father who is in the, the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard from their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. Now, here's the key verse. For your father knows the things you have in need of before you even ask. How many know that God already knows the need before you even walk to him or you get in his presence? He already knows what's going on before you even knew it was going to happen. God already saw what was going to take place last week before it would happen. God sees all things from beginning to end where we are limited. Amen? God already knows how to get you through it. We need to go to him to, so we can walk through the fire if that's what it is we're walking through because God sees you in the midst of that. He already knows what you're going through. He's already got the solution, amen? He's just waiting on you to come to him, stand in his presence and say, Lord, I need you, forgive me, whatever it is, or God, help me in this situation. Lord, heal my broken heart, whatever the situation. How many knows that God is always right there wailing and waiting on us to come to him? That's what he's waiting on. God is awesome. See, individual moments with the Lord Will, be, will produce real transformation. You will see transformation when you spend time with the Lord. You see, if you continue on in, in Exodus 34, here where it says, then God made a covenant with Moses. He said, I'll do marvelous things as had never been done before on the earth. He said, I'm gonna do things that's never even been seen before. That's what I'm gonna do. After Moses had spent time in his presence, his face was actually glowing. How many of you know that, that, that there was a transformation? There was a change that was taking place. And when he went down off the mountain and the children of Israel saw him, they were actually fearful at first. But they knew one thing. They knew that he had been in the presence of the Almighty. Can we say amen? They knew. I believe when we spend time in his presence, the presence of the Lord, we will see transformation. In Exodus 4, following up with the, the other scripture I was reading about, uh, Moses there before he had actually went into Egypt when God was giving him the command to do that their conversation between them uh, continued Moses asked God he said God what if they don't believe me what if they don't believe me that you sent me and that's when he said tell them that the I am sent you he's like yeah but that sounds a little you know think about it if I said you know uh, Fernando go tell your brother, I said he needs to come here and that I am said to, I mean, it would be a little bit odd, all right? It'd be kind of, you'd be like, well, yeah, but God, what do you mean? See, here's the cool thing. God doesn't leave us without the, the right things to, be, to, to take place. And let me just go on and read what I'm talking about here. A transformation took place when God said, see that staff in your hand? He said, the, the one you have in your hand, he said, throw it on the ground. Anybody know what happened? It turned into a snake. Did it not? If you remember later on, that staff is used several times. It's used for different things. He held that staff over what? The Red Sea? And it parted. It also cast it down, and what did it do to the snakes that the Egyptians had cast down? It swallowed them up. It devoured them. It became a snake, and when he took it up again, it became his staff again. God has given us that staff. When we are in his presence, God is equipping us to be boldly proclaimers of the gospel, to go out even when the enemy is trying to defeat us, even when we're walking through the fire, God is saying, I'm going to equip you. I'm going to lead you. 
take my, when he told Moses to bring the people out of Egypt, I'm sure Moses was like, I can't do that, I stutter. And he even said that to God. He said, I'll take care of you. I have your brother Aaron. Amen? He had Aaron to take care of that. He also said, another place God said to him, put your hand in your bosom. And when he did, Moses' hand came out and it looked like it had leprosy. It was wilted. And God told him, place it back. And after he did, he pulled it out again and his hand was restored. Moses knew then he was standing in front of the almighty creator, God himself. He knew then God was the God that he had heard of. The God that met him there at the burning bush, amen? The same God that was standing in front of him, the same God that came down and spoke to him was the God of Isaac, Abraham, and of Jacob, amen? The same God. The God who created Adam and Eve and created all things, this was the God. See, in his presence, God wants to transform us. In his presence, he wants to do marvelous things. In his presence, God wants God's will will be revealed to you. How many know that God will reveal himself to you? And I can have a testimony when Mitchell uh, was telling me at camp, he was, we were praying and, and he said God revealed to him what he wanted him to do in life. And it was totally, you know, a blindside to be honest with you. Mitchell, I had that same experience when I was 17 years old when God called me into ministry. And for a long time, for many years, I did not follow that calling. Sometimes we fail, right? You forgive me? God forgave me. But God wants to reveal himself to you. In his presence, healings will take place. Not can take place, they will take place. As we heard of even Leah speaking about her miracle grandson last week. Many other times, I know people have given testimonies of miracles that God is doing all over this world. I remember uh, one of my friends, I won't tell you the, the whole story, but basically he was in a service and a woman had 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 exasperated. She had passed on and she came back to life. I mean, when you hear stories of Reinhard Bonnke preaching in other nations where people who are, you know, are lame are being healed and miraculously healed and things like that are taking place, but they're spending time in the presence of the Lord. In his presence, stay, remain, and continue in his presence. Can we say amen? We abide in his presence and in his word and it begins to honor the Lord. That's what Jesus said. He said, you honor my Father by this. You honor my Father. Who wants to honor the Father today? How many of us know that when we stand before God, He's going to say, you honored me. You honored me. Even in the little things, you honored me. What an, what a, an awesome thing to have God speak to you. You honored me. You honored me. When we live a life that conforms to God's purpose, we honor him. In John 15, continuing in that chapter 7 through 8, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. But here's the key, by this, by this, my father is glorified. My daddy God is glorified. That you bear much fruit. See, there's a benefit. We begin to bear fruit. So you will be my disciples. And that's what he was saying to the disciples. And you know, when I read the account of, of Jesus speaking uh, to God and he was praying for his disciples, he's like, God, you know, basically he was saying, God, honor these men. Help these men. Help the ones that have followed me. These disciples, they have, they have given up everything to follow me. They've done it all. They've given it up. And you know, many of them didn't even know what the future held. Amen? Many of them were persecuted and killed for the gospel. I think only one wasn't. So, you know, it doesn't seem glamorous, but you know what? They lived a life pleasing to God. And in Luke 6, I want to read this as our praise team begins to make their way up to our, our platform here this morning. In Luke 6, 43 through 45, here's what it says. And I love this scripture. I've read it many times. It says, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit. It's impossible. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bam bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good. An evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Now my 
Final illustration, there was a man who was driving down a highway one day. He noticed a large billboard advertisement for an apartment complex. What piqued his interest was that they, there was a promise of a virtual tour available on these available apartments um, simply by visiting their website. He could go to the website, he could pull up this virtual tour and walk right through this virtual tour, seeing what the apartments look like. Of course, there is one significant drawback to this experience, this virtual experience. It isn't real life, is it? It's a almost life. The virtual house hunter won't be able to meet any of the neighbors. He won't be able to smell the mold or the, or the perfume or the fragrances of that area. He won't be able to hear any of the sounds of any local traffic or parks. He's not even sure what the texture of the granite countertop feels like. The virtual war world represents the real world, but only in a very superficial way. Isn't it true? There are many people today who attempt to live their Christian lives in the same way. Just because we hear about God or listen to stories about His miracles and we hear that the Bible study, we hear that Bible study is really important, we simply are living in a virtual reality tour. It's only an imitation of the real thing. Would we agree? The disciples didn't have a clue. They had no idea. They just knew they were getting, receiving eternal life. They didn't know what kind of life they, they would live in the human form, except what Jesus had said to them. He said, my father will be glorified when you abide in me. He said, my father will receive honor when you abide in me. When you're connected to me and when you follow me, you will glorify my Father by this. And you will be, bear much fruit, and you will be my disciples. I want to be a disciple today. I don't know about you, but I want to bear fruit, and I want to be his disciple. Are we willing to remain? Are we willing uh, to stay? Are we willing to continue in his presence, standing on the truths? Or are we disengaged? Or are we disconnected from what God really has in store for us? I'll let you answer that question. Today, church, let's stay connected. Now, as we bow our heads, we begin to enter in a time of closing. We have plenty of time. Plenty of time. Let's not get in a hurry. Because as the Spirit of the Lord was here earlier, He's still here. Because He's inside of me. And He's inside of you. As we bow our heads and we close our eyes, begin to be reverent to the Lord. I have two requests this morning. I want those of you who are here, and I know some of you are up here on stage, you have a need in your body, and you want to stand before God, and you want to say, Lord, I need healing this morning. I need God to do a miraculous work in my life. I've turned to every doctor. I've turned to different medications. The devil is wearing me out. Maybe you have a, something going on in your thoughts. Maybe you're discouraged this morning and you'd say, I'm so discouraged. I've been walking through something that I don't understand why. I want you to make your way. I want you to get up out of your seat and I want you to make your way down here. And as they're doing this, this is what I want some of our prayer warriors to do. I want our, our board members and Terry, if you would, my brother, some of you that would come forward and begin to lay hands and pray for these folks. It's okay, Kathy, come on up. More of you, get up out of your seats and come forward this morning. As Sharon is playing the very song, In Your Presence, I want to be in the presence of the Almighty God where transformation takes place, where healings take place, where personal change in your life takes place. Maybe you're here this morning and you would say it's been a long time since I've stood before God and I cried out and said, God, I need you this morning. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe there's something that's, that you feel like the devil has taken a baseball bat and he's wore you down. I want you to get up and come forward. 
Maybe you're here this morning and you would say, my family is under the biggest attack it's ever seen in the history of our family. And I know that's, I know that's how Crystal feels this morning. So I'm going to anoint her. She's up here, her and Stephen as well. There are many people, I'll just mention a few of people that are sick. There's a young man named Robert Seward. Many of you know Robert. He works for an electrical company that sells light bulbs. Many of you know him from over the years. He actually attended here at one time. Robert, his kidney stopped working the other day. He's 49, 48 years old. Has a family, four boys and a wife. He's been in RMH for a couple days. And God's working in his life. He's, I'm not discounting that, but he needs, pers- he needs a lot of prayer. I think of Dave, her father, Dave Kite, last week had a mini stroke. A lot of you know Dave. He's a God-fearing man. What a wonderful man he is. Just many, many things going on. Alexis Miller had one quarter of her kidney removed this past week. One fourth. God is doing a work in her life. Vicki Ailes had back surgery this past week. She's in a lot of pain. She needs our prayers. Rick texted me before church. I want someone to come stand in proxy for any of those people. You feel like it? You don't have to mention it. We're just going to anoint you and pray. Jeff Snyder, who's at home today, he's feeling sick. We need to continue to pray for him. Brenda, if you would, you can come up. There's many other people here today that you need a touch in your body. Now, I'm going to pray a corporate prayer, but I want everyone that's down here begin to lay hands on them. We're going to stand in agreement. We're going to pray over these folks. Also, I forgot to mention Isabel Ailes, who continuously is getting these breaks and fractures in her back, and she's not sure why. We need to pray for her this morning that God will do a miracle in her life. Maybe you're here this morning. This is my last plea, and you need Jesus. You'd say, I know I don't, I've not received him into my heart, and if I have in the past, I've walked away from the Lord, and I've backslidden, and I'm in need of a Savior. If that's you this morning, as we bow our heads, just make your way up front. We just want to pray with you. That's it. Jesus is standing here with arms open wide, wanting to receive you. It is his kingdom. So as we lay hands on these folks and share and then begin to pray, First, before I pray, we're going to spend some time in the presence of the Lord. We're just going to be silent as they play and sing this song. We're going to let the Holy Spirit begin to minister. Amen. And I'm going to say a corporate prayer and we're going to be done. I want these prayer warriors and these anointed men and women of God begin to lay hands on these people. We're going to pray with them.